Thank you for tuning in. I'm Tina Honeycutt, and Made in the South is more than just a podcast. It's a heartfelt chronicle of my extraordinary journey. From my humble beginnings of growing up in the foster care system of the 80s and 90s in North Carolina, I've faced and I've conquered it all. Through candid storytelling, I'll dive into the highs and lows of my past, tackling tough topics like sexual assault, neglect, and loss. Yet, amid the darkness, I've always found hope, that unwavering belief in the human spirit's ability to overcome adversity. Please join me on this empowering voyage of resilience and growth, where together we can learn that no matter the starting point, a better life is always within reach. I truly envision this podcast not as just my own narrative, but as a platform for fellow survivors to share their stories too. Together, let's inspire and uplift each other. Thank you so much. Trigger warning, this podcast contains discussions of sensitive and potentially distressing topics, including but not limited to sexual assault, essay neglect, strong language, loss of loved ones, suicide, and domestic abuse. Listener discretion is advised. If you're easily triggered or sensitive to these topics, please take care of yourself and consider whether listening to this content is appropriate for you at this time. If you or someone you know is in crisis or needs support, please reach out to the following hotlines. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline for the U.S. is 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Their crisis text line for the U.S. is text HELLO to 741-741. Again, that's text HELLO to 741-741. The National Domestic Violence Hotline for the U.S. is 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. If you are outside the USA, please seek out your local resources and hotlines for support. Your mental health and safety are important and help is available. You're not alone. Hello, my name is Tina Honeycutt. Thank you so much for joining me. This is my podcast. More like a storytelling podcast at first. It's called Made in the South. One woman's journey, you know, to a better life. My intention with this, creating this podcast, is to inspire and show other people that, you know, you can come from nothing and make yourself something. I want to be able to reach out and, you know, help other people if maybe by somehow expressing some of my trauma that I have lived through and experienced but didn't break me can help others, then I would love to do that. My story is pretty convoluted. It'll take a couple derails. I'm ADHD, but I'm also Southern, so we like to tell stories. That's what we are. We're storytellers. And if I start telling you about one story, it might remind me of another story, and we'll kind of loop around. But I'll try to keep this as segmented and regime <laughs> controlled as I can. Now, I can't promise everything because I am Southern. <laughs> I'm a mother, too. I have two children, so maybe occasionally you might see a little one pop in here and there but for the most part this is going to be about us about me at first but that's just the intro once i get my story out of the way and out the door i would love to be able to meet other guests and have them on my podcast and we can discuss their struggles and how they overcame them especially as females i think that we are we have stories we have so much to tell so much to give and so much hope you know to spread to each other and if I can be a small part of that then I would love to my whole life people said Tina you know what you've got a story to tell so here I am doing my best in my own way to tell my story now people have said Tina you're proud you are so strong and you know I can't believe you made it through all these things and how did you do it I don't know my therapist even asked me that all the time Tina how how did you do it you know, in the moment I was surviving, I was getting through. But I always had this inner Tina, this inner Tina that knew there was more for me out there. So I always kept persevering through it all. All right, there's my brief intro. We will be covering topics that are not kid-friendly. Um, if you, again, I did preface this uh, section with a trigger warning. If you were sensitive to any topics about sexual assault, suicide, loss of loved ones, or domestic violence or abuse, please protect yourself i don't want to traumatize or trigger anyone so proceed with caution my story is a very complicated one i can make several lifetime movies out of it and if i had more patience i probably could write a great story about it but i'm gonna be honest i'm more of a verbal in your face in person kind of talker and teller so here we are 
So it begins in the beginning. It's where everything started. The Bible, Genesis. In the beginning, God created earth, and then there was light. When the beginning, my I wasn't planned for, not even slightly. My father just turned 18, just enrolled into the army. He didn't know what he was doing, and he met my mother, who happened to be a bartender. So she's kind of cute, I guess, or whatever, and they started talking, and they hit it off. But she already had a, a son, my brother, who was already two years old. Next thing you know, young and dumb and full of... And here I came. My dad, my old, being that my father was enlisted, you know, he had the military benefits. So he ended up marrying my mom because he was like, oh, I'm old-fashioned. I want to do the right thing. You know what I mean? Let's marry this woman and let's try to have this baby. You know, that would have been great and all, but my mom couldn't stop doing drugs. And she preferred the company of, you know, other gentlemen callers. And she loved booze and drugs more than she loved my dad or me or my brother, unfortunately. After she had, after she gave birth to me, they separated. Wasn't that messy from what I understand. This is time in the 80s, 85, Desert Storm was just hitting the first one. My dad was shipped out overseas. The state, while my dad was gone, ended up taking me and my brother from my mother. Because, again, like I said, she preferred the company of other gentlemen callers and booze and drugs. Well, they contacted and found my dad. They said, hey, you know what? This is going on. We got the kids. Me. He wasn't my father. He wasn't the father of my brother. We all have different fathers. There's five of us total. <laughs> I've only met three. Of, there was three core siblings, but we'll get to that. You know, and he said, hey, you know, we've taken the kids from Heidi. She's not very safe. Can you come take him? He's like, well, you know, I'm in Iraq right now. I don't have the resources. So he ended up signing his rights away to me because he thought that I was going to go into the system and I was going to be adopted by this nice family. And they kind of had, I did for a brief moment, go. Me and my brother to this really nice elderly couple out on the beach in North Carolina, Carolina Beach. I faintly remember, even though I was really tiny, that beach house and how happy we were playing on the beach but here's the thing about North Carolina especially back in the 80s and 90s they believed that a child's place was for the mother was with the mother no matter if the mother was fit to be a mother or not my mother had this habit of cleaning up just enough to get us back so unfortunately that nice elderly couple that we were bonding with and we were safe and feeling good with we were taken from them and given right back to my mother unfortunately and by then my mother was already pregnant again with my sister now my dad doesn't know all this he thinks that you know he's already signed his rights away he's over there fighting for his life thinks i'm having a good life you know he's young he's 18 what does he know about anything don't blame him for that at all he goes on and lives his life meanwhile we're giving back to this person who should have never had children much less five of them a few years pass you know they take us and they give us back and they take us and give us back but of course again she can't stop doing the drugs none of us know who our father is except me I'm the only child that was actually legitimate my mom was I'm the only one that actually knows who my father was the others they don't know still to this day they don't know who their father is and that's pretty sad I do feel for my other siblings to not know like who you came from for me it was always this internal burning question when I got old enough I'm like who's my dad who do I look like? I grew up in foster care, you know what I mean? Like I, my bio sister, my little sister, she grew up with me. She was a year younger than me. My brother, there was me, the, the hierarchy of the core three. My brother, he was two years older than me. Then it was me, and then my sister, she was a year younger than me. So we always stuck together. The siblings that came after, they were born like seven years after we were taken. So I never met them. We had already been in the system for quite a while. And we were kind of, at that point, my sister and I, Sheila, were settled into the home that we eventually ended up getting adopted to. Again, my story, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's kind of hard to run it in because where do you start? Already, I was living this life of trauma. My mom would just leave us children. The reason why the state took us from us is because she wasn't taken care of. She would just leave us for days while she goes on binges. You know, us kids, my brother's three. You know, I'm, I'm one at the time. He's five. You know, I'm three. My sister's one. she just leave us. <laughs> we would have to fend for ourselves and that did include eating trash out of the trash can I can remember one time and people are like oh you're too young to remember this but I do I actually do remember I remember my brother foraging in a trash can 
and pulling out some old nasty hot dogs from like you know a 7-eleven kind of type of place and we shared that i remembered that even then i was like i don't want to eat all this because i want my sister to have my part and my brother did the same for me he didn't eat much so I, he could give to me and then i would give to her i remember that we had one of the places that we were holed up in all we had was a box spring mattress i can remember the springs poking out as us kids you know, tried to sleep on it, cuddle up. I remember that we never had clean diapers. We were always dirty, always hungry. She didn't care about us. One of my earliest memories of my mother, and this is sad, this is not an early memory that any child should have. I went up to her and I said I was so thirsty. A little tot, you know, in diapers. I said, Mom, I'm thirsty. You know what she did? She handed me a beer can. I said, here, drink. And so, of course, my little two-year-old self went to drink. And of course, there was some cigarette butts just floating up in there, and I, I drank it. And I puked pretty hard for that. I still can't stand the smell of beer to this day because of that. Cannot. The smell of beer, I always instantly remember that vivid moment. And the first food that you're supposed to remember should be like avocados, right? Or fruit. Or oatmeal. Not beer. Not beer tainted with freaking cigarette floating around in it. Well, if that doesn't paint a picture of how great of a mother she was, it gets better. Like I was saying, if that didn't paint a good picture of what she was like a, as a mother, then I have a few more that are a little more graphic than that. Uh, and I'm going to try to make this as, as nice as I can. She had gentleman callers. She didn't care what they did to us, as long as she got high. That's just one of the many things. And I won't go into all the details on that one, but you can just imagine how upsetting it was to learn later on in life that she did that to us. I was raised very Southern, very Christian, and I really believed in saving myself for marriage. But you can just imagine how much more so that I hated her even more because she took from me a gift that was supposed to be for me to give to somebody else. And the fact that she allowed those creatures to touch us her children i'm a mother how anyone could do that and let that happen to their children i will never fathom that there will never be a space in my heart or life for this person there cannot be it just can't i never wanted to reconcile my mother i always had so much anger for her even as a small child I never loved her. I never wanted to be back with her. I was so happy when they took us from her. To me, I was like, oh, finally, we're going to have a safe place to sleep. We're going to have food to eat. We're going to have clothes. Someone is going to be there to take care of us. For me, foster care, the foster system, was better than anything that she could do for me. Unfortunately, my brother did not feel the same way. One moment. Unfortunately, my brother did not feel the same way. He thought the sun rose and set on my mom's ass. He was with her the longest. He was the first one. He loved her so much. Oh my God, he loved her so much. Like later on in life, my brother, man, <laughs> he always, always looking for love in all the wrong places. And you know where that came from? From her. She never had it to give to us. She couldn't. She wasn't capable. Sure, I could rationalize it and say, you know what? She was poor. She didn't have much education. Most likely she was sexually assaulted too, you know what I mean, growing up. And then she got into drugs and she lost herself. And that's all she knew. I could make so many rationalizations for how she became the way she was, but I'm sorry. That's not okay. I fully believe that you are the master of your own destiny and that you can make those choices to be a better person. When I became a mother... It completely changed my whole life. I became a new person. I was no longer living selfishly. And not that I was a bad person or doing bad things, but it makes you, you now have someone else that you are taking care of for the rest of their lives. And if you don't take that seriously, don't have kids. Do not have children. Just don't do it. But my mother kept doing it five different times. My brother loved her. I can't even tell you how much he loved her. He loved her so much, and he hated me for a long time because of this. When I was three, my mother threw me out of a three-story building. 
swear to God, swear on the Bible, all that kind of stuff. The only thing that saved my life was I fell into a rose bush. She took me to the hospital, high as a Georgia pine, and drunk as a skunk. Well, told you, foster care took us from her multiple times and given us back to her. Well, this time they said, oh my goodness, maybe this woman is actually a danger to these children. So they actually took us from her fully and then filed, you know, sealed our files and put us into foster care system and then no longer let her have access to us. My brother hated me for years because I took, he blamed me for us being taken from my mother. And I never knew that for a long time because I adored my brother, man. He, I thought the sun rose and set in his ass. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I loved him. But he was always so indifferent and angry at me. And I could never understand it as a kid. I never could. He was always so sweet and kind to my baby sister. But not to me. He always took all his aggression and anger out on me until he left. <laughs> we hopped in into a few, a couple different homes. And then we finally got settled into one with the Honeycuts. Who eventually did adopt me and my sister Sheila. My brother was with us for a few years, but he didn't like them, so he went back in the system. He didn't want to be adopted. So when they asked if they could adopt, you know, us kids, he said no. And I really wish I had listened to him at that time. Um, but to me, I was little. I was like six when they asked me that question. And you know what I thought? I'm getting three square meals a day. I have food. I have a place to sleep. I don't have to be on the streets or in some ranky-dink warehouse. There's no strangers touching me that I don't want to touch me. Like, I have food. I have a chance to have education. I had safety, at least I thought I did. And to me, coming from the streets and from a mother that was neglectful and abandoned me, this was nirvana, right? Like, I didn't want to leave that. And these people had been in my life for, at that point for three years. So I was like, okay, this is stability. And this is what I know. <laughs> oh, God. And then my sister, she, of course, didn't want to leave me. So me and my sister, we stayed together because that's all we knew. Um, I didn't want my brother to go to the, back into the system and go to another family. I wanted to stay with him. But again, I was too afraid to do it because I had gotten used to the stability of what we had in that moment with that foster home, that foster family, the, the honey guts. They had totally uh, tons of kids. I mean, they were full-on foster care. You know what I mean? Like, we had two bedrooms, and there was four bunk beds in each room. Two bunk beds in each room. So you got, like, eight kids, you know, at a time. So I would always meet these kids, and they would move in and out, always. Um, I got to the point where I didn't get attached to people because every time I cared about someone, they would leave. So you can imagine, like, growing up, that kind of, you know, like interaction with people you get to know them and then two minutes later they're going off to another home so I had a long hard time when I got older to let myself open up to people and care about people because I already started even little as little as five I started building these walls up the castle to protect Tina on the inside you can't hurt me if I don't care about you if you leave that won't hurt me right and also because my mom like it even goes back to my mom I had so much anger I was just full of it burning building up with anger to her how could she do this to us how could she do this to my sister how could she do this to my brother how how could you do that people are like Tina you should forgive and move on and reach out and reconcile and all that kind of stuff but I'm not the kind of person that can do that especially as a mother now I can't fathom how she was able to do the things she, she could do I would die for my children if another man or a person put their hands on my child in an inappropriate way or manner, I would wear that orange jumpsuit gladly. I would. <laughs> it's, it's not even a question. If you say, hey, Tina, are you going to choose between your man or your child? I'll be single the rest of my life, happily so, in that orange jumpsuit. <laughs> you know, like, to me, it's like, I don't, I, don't, I don't get that. I could never fathom that. Drugs. I never got into that. Like, how could you let yourself go so badly over chasing something like that? To, I mean, I get it. She was trying to numb whatever, right? Yeah. But why not use protection? Why not get fixed? Why not keep your fucking legs closed if you're not going to take care of the children you have? Why keep popping them out? Why keep allowing bad people, you know, with them, near them? You know, like... 
so many things that I could, you know, expand upon on that. It's funny, uh, my mom, my adopted mom, she always said, this is a really gross story, but I, I'm going to tell it. So we were used to being hungry. We would starve. We would literally starve. My mom would leave us, or my bio mom would leave us. Heidi would leave us for days at a time. You know, we, like I said in a previous story, we had, we were scavenging out of, you know, trash cans, eating hot dogs. We were freaking raccoons. My um, adopted mom said that when she first adopted us, she didn't have to call the exterminator. And this, I'm so happy <laughs> that my memory blanked this out for me. But she said that we would chase. And if you ever lived in North Carolina, you know that we got water bugs and roaches and everywhere. You can have the place sprayed all you want, but it's just the way the, the natural habitat and the you know, temperatures, and so, it just breeds it. She said that she never had to call the exterminator because we would go and chase and eat bugs. But it's crazy. Survival instinct, even at a young age, will happen. Your will to live. I used to hoard food. I would hoard food and put it under my bed when she first, when we first went into the system because I didn't know when my next meal would be. So my mom would come in there and she would smell something. It was food sitting there under the bed. It took me years for her to break that for me. For a long time as a kid, I would always eat so fast and I would get made fun of in school when I went started going to elementary school because I would eat so fast. Because I was going to eat before it was gone because I didn't know when the next time I'd get food. That was like such an anxiety thing for me. She said that I didn't trust men, that um, when I was little, that my dad, who my adopted dad, who was a teddy bear to us kids, you know, would uh, try to like interact with us. I would like go into the bathroom and like squeeze my little tiny self between the wall and the toilet and just scream, you know, until my mom came and, and helped me out. The trauma. <laughs> you, uh, thankfully, I don't remember any of those memories. The, me the mind does try to protect itself. Eventually, you know, they worked with me and they got me through that. Not all of my adopted time was bad with them. It got bad word later. Uh, maybe I'll save that one for the next podcast. But that's pretty much my beginning at the beginning into the foster care system. I would like to say that the foster care system and the social workers really did take care of us and paid attention to us, but they did not. It, I mean, they gave us back to Heidi so many times when they should have never. The first time she left us, you know, to fend for ourselves, they should have taken us. They should have never given us back, not once. That mentality of, you know, mothers know best and that children should be with their mothers is not always true. Just because you give birth to a child or you father a child does not make you a parent does not give you automatic rights to that child and their body and their future and their life I think that's such bullshit does not instantly make you a parent just because you give birth that person the actions that she took even back then destroyed lives that trickle effect of her addiction and choosing drugs and men and everyone else but herself and her children affected my brother. It affected him greatly in life. My sister too. Me, I was angry, so that didn't affect me in the way that it affected them. They were always looking for love. They were always seeking it. Me, I was too, I was hot, red hot. That anger, I think part of it kept me going for a, wit, for a little bit there. I'm not angry anymore because she doesn't deserve that. Sure, I have a lot of disdain for her as a mother because, again, as a mother myself, I could never. I could never. <sighs> My babies mean everything. 1,010%. I don't even question that, you know? If I was hungry and they were too, guess who would eat first? I'd go hungry for my kids to have food. But they're never going to get to a situation where we don't have food in my cupboards. Because you know why? I work my ass off. I make sure my kids have everything that I never had. And maybe sometimes I overcompensate for it, especially because of my past. Me and my therapist, we talk about it. My kids aren't spoiled. But they definitely have a good life. And it's a good life that I created myself. I made myself. You know what I mean? Like, no one gave me a hand up or helped me. I had to learn the hard way. What I can do as a mother is be better and learn from my experiences. I always said that uh, I saw enough ugly in my life to show me that I never wanted to be like that. Never. My child will never 
Lily nor Le Levi, my children, will never struggle. They will never, they'll never know any of that. They will be children. They'll be allowed to be happy. They'll uh, be allowed to have full bellies, you know what I mean? Like, and no worries when they go to bed at night, unless they're worried about long division for my daughter because she loves math, <laughs> you know what I mean? Those are the things that they have to worry about. Is, is mom going to give me any Roblox, Roblox today to play Roblox? And that's how it should be. They should be children. Man, that's just the tip of the iceberg of all the things that has happened to me. And that's just like the formative years, infant years. I still have a scar on my head from where she threw me out the window. And a chunk out of my leg that never grew back. It's a good reminder. Me and my brother did eventually talk about his anger towards me when he was older. And he did admit that he was wrong for it and he regretted it. That meant a lot. I never understood, again, why he pushed me away and why he was not, you know, as affectionate and kind to me as he was my sister. Unfortunately, I'm the only one left of the core three. My brother ended up committing suicide in 2016 over a female. Well, he was pretty depressed, but it was triggered by a failed relationship and some stuff. Well, that'll be a definitely another story <laughs> later on in this segment. My sister, she ran away a lot when she was 13, 14. When she was 15, she was hit and killed by a drunk driver out while she was out hitchhiking. To know that uh, I'm the only one left that remembers my brother and my sister, especially the small childhood life days. My brother did get adopted to another family. They were amazing, great, wonderful parents to him. You know, they really were. They loved him so much. He was so angry, and they stopped. They were patient with him, and they, they, were, they did the right thing by him. So they knew him for his teenage years and adulthood. So I didn't really get to know that because he lived in a different part of North Carolina at the time with that family. Funny story is their last names end up being Honeycutt, too. And I guess they were like third cousins, twice removed or something. And if that ain't some country fucking shit, if you ever heard of it, <laughs> it is. But they were good people. They loved him in spite of all his anger, and they kept loving him. I'm glad that he had them. I am. I wish that he could have seen his potential. And I wish he could have allowed himself to be loved. And embrace that. Unfortunately, my brother never did. Not really. He had a lot of love to give. Everyone loved him. And when I went back for his funeral, <laughs> all the stories that everyone had, I went to his funeral and everyone's like, oh my goodness. There were so many people there. So many people. They called him Joe Daho. <laughs> I remember I used to always give him so much shit because we would talk on Facebook all the time. Because we had like this jokester kind of relationship. We'd talk shit to each other, but because we're sarcastic. People are like, Tina, you are so funny. And I would always tell people, no, I am not. You need to meet my brother. He is 10 times more funny than I am. If you think I'm hilarious, you should have met Joey. Sometimes that burden of being the one left, it's hard. It's heavy. It's affected me over the years. But I like to think that I'm still here to, remember, to, to keep their memory alive, to honor them. To respect them to tell my children about them there are still some good kernels and all that crap of life we always had each other we did even if we didn't think we did we always had each other we we hung we were the three amigos amigos until my brother left and then it was just my sister and I for a long time until she started leaving <laughs> uh, that's another story we'll get into that one maybe the next podcast thanks so much for uh, sticking with me this was a bit of a ramble. I know it was. But that's just the formative years. Me getting into the system. Me being entrenched and meeting the people that would eventually adopt me. And I would grow up with them and my sister. The first few years were nice. And then it all went south. But we'll save that one for the next <laughs> episode. Thank you so much uh, for joining and listening to my story. I promise I'll try to be more condensed and keep it linear um, for my next episode. So ta-da, this is my first podcast, obviously. Sorry, I went on all these side tangents and stuff, but I'm happy that 
I was able to sit down and kind of get a feel for it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It's going to be on my main page, uh, Tired Tina at YouTube.com. I'll also post this on Facebook. If people want to continue to hear my stories, please drop me some comments below. Love the feedback. I'm really open and receptive to even critical, uh, constructive feedback. So please let me know um, in the comments below what you liked and what you didn't like about this video and if you want to hear some more crazy stories because I have got so many crazy stories and not all of them are bad and whatever some of them are just crazy stories so please like and subscribe thank you so much everyone for joining me on my first podcast made in the south it was totally an honor thank you